Uite mă, femeie, greutățile i-a adus, ce să facem? Copiii sunt mari, noi trebuie să ne ducem la țară, să muncim, să avem pământul nostru, că avem al nostru și copiii să fie lângă noi. Așa a ajuns democrația asta. Ce au știți cum trăia? Mai mâncat și noi ceva. Acum, asta este. Mai, ce se face? Uite, am trăit un porcel, îl mâncăm, Bem cu de vin, ce să facem? Mai vin copiii, mai ajută pe noi la săpat, mai ajută la arat cu arătură, cu tot. Thank you everyone for coming today and I have to say I'm a, uh, a bit nervous since I've attended this seminar series tens of times but I never really thought I'll be on uh, this end of the table. It's a great honor for me. Today I want to talk about life of kinship in a Romanian village where I did two years of field work from 2008 to uh, 2009. And I will start, as anthropologists are wont to do, with an ethnographic uh, vignette. I was uh, having a, a beer with my um, construction team mates. This was one of my identities in the field was as an apprentice builder. When uh, word came that uh, uh, Vasile, uh, a man I knew, was found dead in front of his uh, house. I knew one of his uh, neighbors because we did some uh, work at her house and we were close. I went to her, I told her the news, I woke her up, so we went to, uh, to see what was happening. When we got to the scene, it was already a very frantic scene. The two daughters of the old man came from a nearby town, uh, everybody was uh, dusting off the place, cleaning, uh, he was, they had dressed up uh, the body, and they were preparing for the three days of wake. And actually I was a bit surprised that uh, there was so commotion around, uh, however, there weren't many signs of uh, grief. Everybody was uh, really, really trying to make the place look as good as possible, while the old man was already laying in a coffin, and it seemed that he was almost uh, forgotten there. But of course, this was just a stage from a long and complex uh, ritual of uh, mourning that ended up with a funeral and then continued with the many mortuary practices for seven years. But there was one conspicuous absence there, and that was uh, Vasile's brother. In fact, nobody expected him to be there. More shocking for me was the fact that Vasile was living right next door. However, they had a very tense relationship all across life. Vasile was a very, very funny individual. And uh, once when we were working, he came and he told us a story of how he came from the army. And uh, he saw a little baby in a cot. And uh, he, had, he, said, he said to us, so I was wondering, is this the baby of my daughter? Is it the baby of my mother? Yeah, I didn't ask, I just turned around and left. So he said, had I knew that was the little devil, I would have turned that cot upside down, meaning he would have killed him. And indeed, uh, the two brothers uh, had uh, 
huge conflicts uh, all across their life, starting from um, conflict over inheritance. They both inherited sheep from their father, and the father aligned with one rather than with the other one. They got into fights. These fights became physical. They were not on speaking terms, to say the least. To give you a sense of uh, their enmity, each of them had built a four meter wall towards the other person's household, which was, well, not only for protection, was obviously a symbolical gesture of uh, cutting out all kinds of relationships. And actually people were gossiping that he's probably drunk with joy and buying drinks to all his friends. This is a, a tale of two brothers, which is probably an extreme case, but it's an example of many other examples that I have discovered in uh, certain of uh, relatives no longer recognizing and behaving towards other relatives as relatives. As uh, Satanis say, no se mai sino de namur. They no longer held on to each other as relatives. And now here's another story. This is Razwan, another of my friends and informants, who was uh, a young uh, and aspiring shepherd. And uh, one of his uh, best friends was um, Gheorghe, another shepherd, both of them really heavy, muscular guys with a really assertive demeanor that uh, helps quite a lot in the sheep owning business of uh, Saten, where you have to uh, protect your interests by word and by uh, act, and usually by fist. This man had a really close relationship. You could uh, find them everywhere, in uh, markets, selling cheese, in the town tavern, buying rounds to one another, always sitting one next to another one, always calling out on their ritual kin terms, since uh, Razvan had baptized Gheorghe's daughter. So they became Kumatru. Kumatru uh, is the ritual brotherhood that develops between uh, two people. One of them is the godparent of the other one's child. Once Razvan told me about their relationship, that they were such good friends that they wanted to make themselves relatives. And in fact, something I've just realized last night when I was thinking about this case, none of these two men had brothers. They had sisters, but they didn't have brothers. And having a brother is quite important, especially for sheep owners who are really driven by this uh, image of masculinity, but also by the kind of actual support that having uh, a strong male close relative offers you since uh, shepherds are often engaged in conflict over pasture, over um, uh, symbolic dominance in uh, taverns and in other domains of Sateni social life, and increasingly in local politics. What we have here is two brothers by birth that slowly became enemies and stopped all kind of uh, kin recognition and kin behavior, and on the other hand, Two people who had no genealogical, no biological relationship, and they became closer than brothers usually are in certain kinship. And this speaks a little bit about a deep paradox in uh, the morality of Saten relatedness. A few words about Saten. Saten is a village in northeast Romania, in the cultural region of Moldova. Different from the Republic of Moldova, but uh, rather similar in uh, many aspects, such as uh, dialect and many customs. And it's one of the poorest areas in Romania, hence one of the very, very poorest areas of the European Union. This village may be described as what sociologists usually call a low-trust society. From the moment I got to the village, a well, very serendipitous and fortunate uh, manner, since I was uh, preparing to do fieldwork in Athens, a completely different uh, uh, topic, uh, but when the um, economic crisis of the late 2000s hit the construction industry, a lot of people moved back to their villages, so I was left without a topic and without a locale, so I just had to follow them. And I followed some of them with uh, whom I had some really good relationships. And since we engaged in various reciprocal favors, I already had a foothold in the village, which uh, helped me then develop an identity as apprentice builder, as a friend, as a political ally in certain, in certain ways. But when I got to this, so then everybody was telling me exactly the same thing. Don't trust anyone. 
don't trust people. People cannot be trusted. Of course, they didn't mean themselves, since we already had a relationship, and they didn't mean their relatives, since they were introducing me to all their relatives, and they were vouching for me, and they're vouching for their relatives' trustworthiness. But at each step, I was warned that I'm too naive, I'm too benevolent, that people will take advantage of me, that I shouldn't trust what people are saying, and I should always keep guard. In fact, one of the things that one of my closest friends told to me, and something that really stuck, was he saying that here, the sheep that cannot carry its wool gets eaten by the wolves. This ethic of self-responsibility against a, a dangerous world. And this comes uh, with a very elaborate culture of uh, suspicion and secrecy. The domestic domain is quite a fascinating elaboration of this culture uh, with as little information as possible about the wealth and the social interactions of the household being available to external eyes with certain parts being kept private. Or the pedagogy of secrecy that even children are taught, they should not give from the house, meaning that they should not divulge information and they should even lie to strangers or other people who inquire about them. And a lot of, of the things that I've discovered in Saten uh, evoke um, very old themes such as uh, what Banfield called a moral familism. The idea that one should uh, strive for or maximize the interests of one's own family and assume that everyone else does the same and expect no cooperation from others. And also there are echoes of Forster's uh, limited good approach since many things in life certainly do consider as being limited. And this is usually associated in my society with envy. And indeed, in, uh, even in this village, there is this cultural belief in Deok, the evil eye, that uh, animals, children, tools, buildings can be attacked by supernatural agencies, which are created by other people's envy. Actually, I was told that I should stop being so curious and being so amazed of everything, uh, since people will think that I'm going to harm them. One of the, from the first uh, days, the, the moral discourse that was presented is that there is a sharp distinction between two kinds of people. On one hand, you have the relatives, and those are the people that you can trust, those are the people with whom that you know them, and you cooperate with them, and they're nice people, and then you have the strangers. And stranger means exactly this, not relative. And you should be afraid of strangers, never tell them what's on your mind, always be on your guard. And the sense was what John Campbell, the famous Sarakats and ethnographer, described as a sense of being under constant siege. And this was uh, something that I, um, I felt from the first days. On the one hand, we have this uh, ideology that relatives are moral. On the other hand, I think it was the second day that, uh, that a man told me, not even the devil fucks you like the relatives. <laughs> and indeed, most of the conflicts and most of the tensions in that society were not with strangers, but they were with relatives. There was suspicion of treacherous relatives, of envy. There's a lot of folk wisdom which warns one that uh, relatives can be bad, uh, sometimes possibly comparing neighbors or friends with relatives. And one, um, one saying that came across quite often was this, um, it's a bit hard to translate, but it's sound like brother, brother, yeah, but cheese costs money, which sort of contrasts the bonds of kinship with the uh, individual necessity to be self-responsible. How does Satani uh, solve this uh, paradox that kin, on the one hand, are moral agents in one's social life, and on the other hand, they seem to be the most uh, dangerous enemies. So they do it by uh, this discourse of holding or not holding on to kin. So it's in the neamur, as I say. To hold really means like physically hold. In the same way, it means like uh, designing something as. So, so to hold on as relatives means, um, well, a series of things. First of all, is uh, reciprocal and ostensive recognition of uh, relatedness. For example, the use of kin uh, terms. Something I've observed is that kin terms uh, are not used for very close relatives. So for example, you wouldn't call a brother by his kin term, you'd call him by his uh, uh, name, but you'd emphasize the kinship 
with something like second cousins and especially ritual kin. That would always be called by a kin term. And sometimes you can see it in a tavern, it's uh, being called out. It's not only for that other person, but it's for all the other people to hear and recognize that kin relationship. Perhaps the most important aspect of holding on to kin is in the participation in the social life of the other person. Fundamentally is attending family rituals. From uh, baptism, wedding, especially funerals, the, the, the key life stages, relatives who hold on to each other are there, either just uh, to, to, to offer their respect, uh, but often also to uh, provide practical support. And another important part is the Hram, which is the patron saint day of a village. And then you have relatives from another village. They are expected to come. A family would prepare a meal. They don't invite anyone, but they just expect people to come. So for a whole day, you have relatives coming. And also they have this, what I call, fatic house visits. When you visit someone without any kind of business, but you just visit them. If you happen to be in the neighborhood, if you happen to be around, you just pay a visit, uh, you catch up uh, over coffee, over drinks. Something interesting is that, because a lot of uh, Satinia are now migrating to Western Europe, when they come home during holidays, they, they increase these kind of visits. Something uh, that I was surprised that they were bringing coffee and chocolate that was brought from Lidl, uh, and they brought it from Germany or the UK. And I said, well, listen, it's, this is exactly the same coffee and chocolate. You have it here. Uh, why did you spend so much time? So they said, so relatives will know that we thought of them. It's not the object, but the fact that the object was brought from Italy meant that you were in their mind in Italy, and they thought about you before coming home. And of course, uh, holding on has um, a very deep pragmatic aspect to it, which is reciprocal help in various uh, activities. Traditionally, it used to be like agricultural work, haymaking for a certain intense uh, labor days, for uh, the collective uh, building of uh, houses. And of course, it means automatic solidarity with a relative in case they uh, get into a conflict with a third party. So automatically, you should be loyal to them and thus become, volens nolens, adversary to their adversaries. Now, of course, there is a mirror image of this, which is not holding on to kin. When people say they don't, nu se in the nama, they don't hold each other as well. This. And this involves avoidance, uh, obfuscation, even outright denial of kin ties. This may be unilateral when one party no longer holds the other as kin, but can be mutual. They no longer hold each other as kin. Sometimes I was trying to trace a kin relationship between two people and I knew there was a rather decent but there was a relationship. So he said, okay, how are you two guys related? And he said, mm, you see, my mother and his mother were both women. <laughs> yeah. So he was, he, uh, he played, I mean, they play a lot of pranks on this, especially on ethnographers, because it's, it's fresh meat. So they sort of denied any kind of relationship, or saying that, well, everybody's relative here, if you go long enough, it's not uh, meaningful. One of the ways you see that people no longer hold each other as relatives is uh, that they don't go to each other's funerals, and this is something that people say. When they want to emphasize that uh, a kin tie, a kin bond, no longer exists, they say they no longer go to each other's death. So this means that whatever kind of genealogical uh, type of kinship uh, can be traced, in actual reality, it's nil, it doesn't exist. This means there's no offer or expectation of generosity, of altruism, of uh, solidarity, and as people say, they're just as strangers. I want to start from this uh, ethnographic case to um, approach a theme which is as old as anthropology itself, but however one which for various uh, reasons, is no longer an interesting topic for anthropologists, which is kinship. Now, and I'm going to use Marshall Salen's um, book, What Kinship Is and Is Not, not only for the book itself, but I think because it reflects a widespread view among um, social cultural anthropologists that Salen is uh, defined as uh, kinship being culture and not biology. So, Salins argued against the bounded and self-regarding bourgeois individual of the biological sciences, saying that kinship is based on intersubjectivity, on cultural representations of shared substances, solidarity, and many other forms, creative forms, in which people create kinship, apparently in uh, disregard of the facts of biology. 
Although controversial, this view tries to salvage the idea of uh, that there is such a thing as kinship, uh, something denied by people like Needham or, uh, or by Schneider, while still making a sharp distinction between culture of kinship and whatever processes uh, human biology uh, exist. I think that uh, a problem is that when Salins discusses about biology, he has an extremely narrow view of it. To be honest, his perspective has not changed much from his 1976, if I'm not mistaken, critique of sociobiology. Because for him, biology means only kin selection, which is a very important mechanism in evolutionary biology, but is by no means the only relevant one. Even more ironical, it's exactly kin selection which in biology expresses the reality that Salins discusses as mutuality of being. What is the premise of kin selection? Neo-Darwinian biology is no longer focused on the organism, it's focused on the genes. In biology, it's a genes point of view that matters. Kin selection is based on the idea that an individual is going to behave altruistically towards other individuals based on Hamilton's rule. If the cost of that behavior is smaller than the benefit that the other individual is going to receive, multiplied by the coefficient of relatedness. For example, a sister, from a biological point of view, is a vehicle which carries 50% of your genes. A first cousin, 12.5%. A nephew, 25%, and so on. So in a way, these genetic relatives are, truly live each other's lives if we look at the point of view of the gene. Because for the gene, it doesn't matter if it's this organism or if it's another organism that's going to survive. As Hamilton quipped when he was asked, would you give up your life for a brother? And he said, no, but I would do it for two brothers or eight cousins. Because <laughs> from the gene's point of view, it matters not whether it's an individual, two brothers or eight Cousins. So it's also when, uh, when discussing kin selection, he ignores uh, the very influential model of Robert Trivers, which is that between relatives, it's not all well. Sometimes it's a deep kin conflict. For example, even between parents and offspring, there is conflict. And that conflict even begins in the womb. In the womb, the fetus and the mother are engaged in a war of attrition in which each of them is trying to invest as little as possible, and they're struggling. This is just one example of the many, many biological things which may be useful to understand cultural representations of kinship. However, the mutuality of uh, being that Salins uh, offers for kinship does have some valuable insights. Moreover, these resonate with certain biological mechanisms over and beyond genetic kin selection. Now let's think about culture. Since Salins has many other anthropologists talks a lot about culture without actually defining it. Now I'll start from an idea, a naturalistic model of culture, which is that culture, an idea proposed by Dan Sperber in his Malinowski lecture right here in 1985, is an epidemiology of representation. Culture is a distribution of public and mental representations which are created in social, cognitive, causal chains. These representations travel from one mind to another one through communication and representations can be more or less cultural depending on how successful they are. Meaning how many people will hold that representation, whether we speak in horizontal terms or in vertical terms, so spreading to more people horizontally or across time. And that's why it says that representations can be more successful if they are culturally attractive given two large kinds of factors. First, we have psychological factors of attraction, mind internal factors, because certain ideas will be sticky because they fit in with the architecture of our mind. And here, of course, one of the most important aspects of the architecture of our mind is the evolved design of minds, because the mind is what the brain does, and the brain, just like any other organ, is an evolved organ. It has functions and its architecture was designed by natural selection and its mechanisms have a functional design. The other large body of factors are ecological. Ecological factors are those that exist outside the mind. 
And we have a great example of how we, how we can apply the epidemiological representation of culture in the case of kinship. Maurice Bloch and Dan Sperber took this model to uh, explain one of the oldest puzzles in uh, the anthropology of kinship, which is the particular relationship between the mother's brother and his nephew in patrilineal societies. And they argue that we can explain that uh, the avunculate, that spatial relationship, as being uh, culturally attractive because we have a mind internal factor of attraction, which is the evolved mechanisms to detect genetic kin, since uh, people can recognize the facts of uh, genetic relatedness, and the relationship between a maternal uncle and his nephew has 100% certainty of genetic resemblance. 25% to be more precise. Uh, this is something that all humans are want to do. But in a patrilineal society, of course, the mother's brother and his nephew do not belong to the same social group. They belong to different lineages. So in this case, their relationship is not uh, one of, uh, there are no inheritance uh, rights, uh, their identity is different. However, because people everywhere will trace these genetic uh, relationships uh, due to uh, interests of inclusive fitness, they say that uh, there's going to be a cultural attraction towards a special relationship between them, which is like tolerated theft, many forms of generosity from the uncle to the nephew, that both the actors involved and all the others are going to find in some way salient. And they say, of course, that there is a large plethora of cultural representations about this relationship, but it appears through an intersection of mental factors of attraction, kin recognition, and ecological factors, in this case, the social organization of patrilineal descent groups. We have to admit that Salins did get something right, which is that genetic kin recognition is definitely not the only cultural factor of attraction for kinship. Since I just mentioned, unilineal descent groups fly in the face of uh, kin recognition. Since uh, you divide relatives according to whether they come through males or through females, you consider one of them part of your group, your identity, and the other ones not. Even though in genetic terms they are absolutely similar. Why should you marry your cross cousin and not your parallel cousin, for one of them is incestuous and the other one is uh, mandatory, preferred, or, or possible, even though in genetic terms the distance is absolutely identical. Moreover, ties of affinity are recognized, although there may be no genetic uh, relationship between those people. Then we have classificatory kinship terminologies, which cluster together people who might have quite a different genetic distance to ego. Then we have kinship created through co-residence, through ritual, through adoption, through sharing um, houses, sharing meals, sharing blood, sharing uh, milk, and so on. And all of these ideas have been mentioned by Salins and many other anthropologists, some of them here in the room, as being a uh, fundamental part of kinship. So, can this mutuality of being, is it enough to classify it as a purely cultural phenomenon and uh, fundamentally distinct from biology? Or can we find another factor of cultural attraction which is still a natural mechanism rooted in biology? And as you probably have guessed, my answer is yes. <laughs> Mutualistic cooperation. Rigorously speaking, kin altruism is not cooperation. When you are being altruistic towards your genetic relatives, you are phenomenologically altruist, but uh, you are biologically egotist. Because you're not helping them as organisms, you're helping that part of them which has the same genes as you, as the same biology. Scratch an altruist, see an egotist bleed. However, many animals, not only humans, do have many forms of cooperation, meaning costly behaviors for self, bringing benefits to others, which cannot be reduced just to kin selection. Animals, just like humans, cooperate. However, in biology, pure altruism gets selected out. Your, um, those traits that uh, make you incur costs for oneself, only costs for oneself, will not survive. Right? They will be selected out. So, in one way or another, any kind of altruistic behavior 
will be selected if somehow there is a benefit for the self, a benefit which is higher than the cost. However, cooperation can offer this. So in biology, an important body of theories about cooperation discusses mutualism, just like silence but coming from different direction. Now, mutualism uh, is about cooperative interactions which offer mutual benefits. But simply, organisms cooperate because together they can achieve benefits that they cannot achieve on themselves. And we have many such cases of mutualism, sometimes between species and sometimes within a certain species. Examples for animals, but can be also applied to humans, is the production, consumption of resources, defense, exchange and transmission of resources. Now, how can um, cooperation get off the ground? And there is a vast literature on this. And cooperation is, is very, very hard um, in cognitive terms, in uh, ecological terms. But one model is partner choice. Uh, Norris and Hammersmith have proposed the idea of a biological market of cooperation, in which people are looking for cooperative partners and they advertise themselves as cooperative partners. Each actor is going to look out for partners with whom to cooperate that will offer the highest benefits for themselves. And of course, in order to be chosen as a cooperative partner, <laughs> you have to offer benefits yourself. Now, in the case of humans, a theory that was proposed by Nicolas Bomar and others such as Pat Barkley is that natural evolution has designed our minds with an inclination for fairness. We intuitively evaluate how much people contribute and how much people take from cooperation in order to assert whether it's a fair division of the benefits of cooperation. And partner choice is a mechanism through which these uh, intuitions for fairness have uh, developed. So this is an evolved disposition, it's pan-human, it's universal, it's early emerging in infancy. For example, just to give an example, when um, infants look at uh, two actors who are doing something together, but one of them contributes more to the joint effort than the other actor, they expect that uh, the agent who contributes more should receive more. So fairness does not mean equality. It means equality. It means that there is a fair distribution of benefits according to contributions. This can explain uh, paradoxical results in anonymous uh, economic games, which fly in the face of the so-called rational man. For example, in ultimatum uh, games, in which people are uh, told to split a certain sum, and the other person can either accept the division or can reject it and then nobody gets anything else. And across the world, people tend to be irrational in economic terms because they lose $1 or $10 or whatever is at stake, whatever is being offered, unless they are given a fair distribution of that shared sum. And for economists, this doesn't make sense, but from a point of view of fairness, it, it does make sense because we expect uh, others to uh, split what is seen as a collective benefit fairly with us. And, and also the fact that people usually in this kind of ultimatum games, they could offer like nothing or the smallest amount to others. However, they tend to offer more. So there is an intuition of fairness which makes us offer, and there is an intuition of fairness which makes us refuse certain uh, offers. But of course, this intuition uh, of fairness uh, developed through partner choice is variable across societies and across uh, cultures because the parameters of cooperation are different are very different across history and across different societies. They are not the same kind of opportunities and constraints for cooperation. I will I discuss this in certain society. Something which is quite important and has to be mentioned is one of the most fundamental but often ignored distinctions is that between ultimate and proximate mechanisms. Ultimate mechanisms are those that answer the question why. The why questions usually go back to natural evolution, to natural selection, adaptation, and so on. Proximate mechanisms answer the question how. How is something happening? Just to give uh, an example, jealousy. We can uh, think about jealousy, we, we experience it, we talk about it, we can reflect about it, but only here 
you would not get to the ultimate mechanisms of jealousy, which are mechanisms of uh, sexual selection in order to make sure that your genes are um, in the baby begotten by a woman, to make sure that's yours, or the other way around, to make sure that uh, a male partner will not desert his female partner after insemination and make her pay the costs of uh, raising children. Now, the word nam in uh, Saten and in Romanian means relatives. And by relatives, they mean everything. Cognitive descent with Eskimo terminology, nothing spectacular, it's European kinship. The same term for nibbling and grandchildren. Namur, plural, means also Athens, by exogamous marriage, with a tendency towards very local residence, but this has sort of changed in the recent years. Also cases of adoption, there is a preference for blood relatives, but something which is also increasing is old couples adopting adult, either single individuals or couples because they are childless or their children have left in order to to take care of them in old age and to bury them and perform funerals. And there's also ritual, Nemura also ritual kin, so spiritual parents and brothers through Orthodox baptism and marriage. Now, the idiom of blood is very important in uh, Seten. And if you'd ask people, the first thing they think about with Nemur is consanguine relatives. And uh, with blood comes an entire discourse. Uh, so there is an essentialist inference that people who share blood, this explains uh, shared physical traits, but also character traits. And this can sometimes be traced one or two generations ago. Quite a lot of time people shift between talking about humans and animals in the same way. So they would say that certain traits have been thrown, as I said, in a lamp, and they say that certain trait has been thrown in somebody's grandson. And they say this, that blood does not turn into water. Sengileapa, nusefage. And by this they mean that everything else being kept equal, there is an expectation of default ametry between cognates, which on the one hand evokes those innate dispositions for kin altruism, but also evokes the classical amity of kinship, Bosa Meyer Fortes, that we should be able to trust kinfolk in a way that's not automatically possible for others. However, both Pete Rivers and Maurice Bloch have uh, questioned this, and Pete Rivers said, well, why do we define kinship by friendship? Why do we use amity, which means friendship, to, to discuss about kinship? And on the other hand, why does friendship so often like to masquerade itself as kinship? The only corporate group in Saten is the family. And the best way to define a family is people who share a household. Ideally, this is a couple with their kids, perhaps parents or even grandparents. Sometimes they can be uh, single collaterals uh, living and very some, uh, some people with a very distant uh, relationship or they're just like really poor people who are brought in uh, as servants in the family. Traditionally, there was a system of partible inheritance at marriage. Both men and women received a share of uh, the family patrimony. Most important was land, but also animals, tools. And this led to intense sibling rivalry because uh, siblings are pitted in a zero-sum game against each other. If one of them got more, then the others got less. Added to this, the fact that uh, you inherit a slice of land, sometimes a large house plot, a yard was split into two, meant that close collaterals also remained neighbors which was a mixed blessing, as we shall see. Again, traditionally, marriage was assortative according to land and status. As Satanists say, the rich marry the rich, the poor marry the poor. It used to be the case that marriages were largely arranged uh, with the elders discussing over drinks, or long nights, how much will each family give to the spouse. And they're trying to match the contributions, but also taking into consideration how many other children they had to marry, and they were trying to get the best deal for themselves. Sometimes there was uh, an avenue for hypergamous marriage. If a poor girl was uh, very beautiful, young, and hardworking, or if a poor man was industrious and uh, powerful, and especially if uh, he would have, uh, as people say, female verb marry, which is a bit derogatory, meant that he would move with his uh, wife's parents, which is a slight decrease in social status. This is a genealogical tree which shows patterns of conflict and cooperation between relatives. In black it's conflict, in white is cooperation. <laughs> and if even Spichar said that if you want to understand anything about uh, Nuer um, social interactions is Cherche la Vache, uh, for Seteni is Cherche la Terre.
because most of these conflicts have at some point conflict over land. Somewhere in the middle, a huge conflict appeared when a daughter of Florica and Andre, as a very young lady, like she was 16 or 17, she was raped by a neighbor, and the rape was actually a strategic move to force her into marriage, and the future groom's family basically extorted the land from uh, her parents. So she received quite a large plot of land, which made all the other siblings receive less. And then two more kids were born in that family. And one of the middle uh, sisters was preparing to get married. She said that she was about to take those two children to the river because two more daughters meant uh, a decreasing uh, inheritance for her. And there were already a lot of them. And the first daughter had already left with something like a third of the family patrimony. So intense sibling. And these things, they... Um, reproduce year after year and generation after generation. So you may have a split one, two or three generations ago and the descendants are still now on not speaking terms. But of course, sometimes they do find avenues for cooperation. There is a structural tension between siblings and their descendants and also Athens because Athens will side with one sibling against another sibling and there are finds a very important element is the um, very pernicious effect of post-socialist land restitution. So land was collectivized during communism and then in uh, the 90s it was given back to people according to old property rights. Now people could not find documents, the whole process was dysfunctional. There was a lot of corruption, patronage, people went to court, people started killing each other, brothers killing brothers. Again, close residence is a double-edged sword because for example, if you have a three hectares of land, then it gets divided between two siblings. They each get a set. Now, this means that uh, it can go two ways. They can cooperate, for example, they can coordinate on agricultural work and so on. They can protect each other's uh, property, but it can go the other way around. Let's say there was some sort of, um, of a fight over inheritance. Now think about it. It's not only that you hate your brother, but you see him every day and his land is right next to you. And then you have people plowing an extra furrow into the other's lands. Once animals go into the other person's uh, pasture, they steal a little bit, they destroy and so on. And even if they don't do it, there is this suspicion that they did. You see that sheep have entered and they've eaten your, uh, your corn. Who did it? And then your mind goes to your salient enemy, which as like as not, is your close relative. Another structural factor for kin amnesia is something which is best summarized by a folk song, which goes something like this. When you're rich and you're doing well, everybody's your kin. When you're poor and you're doing bad, not even your kin is your kin. The rich forget their relatives. Why? Because uh, they're no longer attractive cooperative partners. They're looking for cooperators by this kind of uh, economic affinity because they have something better to offer and they will look for uh, rich cooperative partners and those poor relatives that come are a burden. So what they do, they start calling them to weddings, uh, they don't go to their funerals, they no longer hold on to them as relatives. We can see the opposite pattern of holding on to kin. The fact that land was collectivized during communism meant there was less uh, conflict over uh, inheritance of land. There was still inheritance of house plots, animals and other things, but uh, taking out the land was uh, something that helped siblings get into less conflict. Also, the fact uh, that there were uh, smaller sibling sets. It used to be six, seven, eight, now it was two or three, and increased affluence during communism in various degrees, so they had more to split between a less number of siblings. Also, increased division of labor meant that they were no longer engaged in this kind of zero-sum game, like those two brothers who were both shepherds. Now, one of them might be a shepherd, the other one might specialize in agriculture, another one might move to the city. And uh, this uh, rural-urban relation became quite important, especially in the late years of communism, when uh, food was very scarce in the cities, but it was relatively abundant in the rural areas. And that's when the city folk remembered their relatives in a village and they started paying these kind of visits and they would return with a carcass of pork in uh, the trunk of their car. And of course, uh, the rural folk also needed their city relatives for hospital visits, for bureaucratic work and so on. So they started holding on each other as kin again. And this, the same thing happens with international migration. 
Ritual kinship has definitely uh, developed much more. So people remember that ritual kinship was important in the past, but not as important as it is now. And why? Because you can really make relatives out of the people that uh, you want to have as relatives. The best example is political patronage. So people who uh, go for like mayor position, one year before they baptize children all across the village. And of course, people want to have a godparent who might one day be a mayor because then you go, you have certain business with them. Also, this uh, geographical extension of kin ties is important. You may want to have a godparent in the city, maybe it was a friend of a relative, and having a godparent uh, there was somebody that you could call and go to when you, had, uh, when you had to interact with the state. Also, this kind of professional affinities. Shepherds are really much tied to this kind of ritual kin ties. I had a talk at CIS uh, a couple of days ago. So a local businessman from elsewhere participated in uh, parliamentary elections. So he needed a local agent in Saten. He got to uh, my friend through three ties of uh, ritual kinship. So godparent, one child, godparents, one child, and three shepherds, all of them recommended, oh, I know someone, oh, I know someone, oh, I know some, and he got to his agent and they started collaborating. Another important uh, factor is as Yun Tiong Yang for China is the increased independence of the nuclear family, uh, less dependent on uh, older generations, and in general, less dependent upon uh, genealogical kinship in general. And also the emergence of friendship, I realized that Old people almost never use the term friend. I mean, they knew it, but it was not something that they would use automatically. It was something like, well, neighbor or some sort of kin tie. As old uh, ladies would ask you, you know, to whom do you belong? Right? To whom do you belong means, how can I trace you through genealogical links to someone that I know? But being a friend of someone yeah, okay, doesn't mean much. But for young people, friendship is important. So basically, I argue that so then kinship expresses the patterns of mutualistic partnerships. As I uh, say in the book, we can see kinship as a tree. So it grows out of the natural roots of the facts of uh, biology, birth. And this offers the first natural roots of consanguines. Then you have pruning and grafting of branches. Through marriage, through adoption, through ritual kin, you graft branches. But at the same time, you prune unwanted branches, which can be of either kind. Like consanguines, affins, or ritual, they can be lost. There are patterns, holding or not holding relatives. There are so many ways in which you can held or not held kin, but what keeps everything together is this mutualism of cooperation. As long as people hold on to relatives as cooperative partners, they get with mutual benefits, there is kinship. When that sort of peters out or becomes conflict, that's when kinship in the sense of like active relationship, moral relationship, disappears. So, just to summarize, I would say that on one hand, if we take the genealogical um, factor of attraction, which is linked with uh, inclusive fitness and cooperation as another factor of attraction based on the psychology of uh, fair mutuality, we may see this four loci of cultural attraction in Sateni kinship. We have presence or absence of genealogical relatedness and presence and absence of mutualistic cooperation. This gives us four ideal forms of kinship. Strangers, no cooperation, no genealogy. Unheld relatives, there's genealogy, but there's no cooperation. Made relatives, where there is no genealogy, but there is creation of kinship through mutualistic cooperation. And the perfect case where you have both genealogy and mutualistic cooperation. Of course, genealogical relatedness is stable, while mutualistic cooperation is variable. What has changed across time are not the mechanisms of king recognition, the kind of motivational mechanisms to recognize and to help kin. What has changed is in the domain of the opportunities and the constraints of cooperation. Whether it's about agriculture, it's about politics, it's about division of labor, raising animals, and many, many other aspects of life. Here are some elements from uh, anthropological literature which seem to discuss about the same thing that mutualistic cooperation is a factor of cultural attraction in kinship. Lineages as uh, cooperative groups sharing norms which facilitate cooperation. Patrilineal descent as uh, a form of creating a group of agnates 
which is very valuable for protection, and that's why it's associated with uh, pastoralism, especially in Africa. Even for Claude lévi the change from simple to complex marriage systems is in a way the change from reciprocal altruism, one-to-one, -to, -one, to mutualism, which is you give out a daughter and from a group of cooperators, another daughter will come to replace her. And of course, and what we see is that a lot of uh, the dogmas and the ideologies which are negating the presence of the importance of biological kinship, they have to do it because those intuitions exist. As Rita Suti show, that uh, discourse that children do not resemble their parents does not mean that people don't believe that uh, biological uh, traits get transmitted. They know they are, but they deny it because to assert that would increase too much the relationship between children and parents. And what the VES want to do, they want to create these cooperative uh, networks of uh, cooperative uh, child breeding, which is again about cooperation. It's not about inclusive fitness. But why is NAM, why is kinship good to think is? And then I'll end with this. Why not just friendship, right? Why not focus on cooperation? And I would say that, and this is speculative, because of our intuitions about kinship, they create a stable and intuitive uh, launch board to think about social relationships. Because it's pan-human, it's going to be intuitive for everyone, it's going to be catchy. It's something that people can evoke in communication with others and people will understand it quite easily. Friendship, on the other hand, is a very idiosyncratic relationship. I mean, friends can have various degrees of uh, closeness of um, emotional uh, affiliation and so on. But for um, kin positions, there is a certain uh, intuitive expectation of, uh, well, distant kin versus closer kin. What is the intensity of altruism? Uh, what is the direction of it? I mean, if it's uh, from older people to younger people or the other way around. This shared biogenetic substance, which again appears in many cultural accounts. So it offers, in a way, uh, a good grammar to make, uh, like as all grammars uh, are capable of, of creating an infinite uh, amount of statements based on a limited set of uh, parameters. In biology, kin altruism is unidirectional. You don't care about what the other things, you just invest in that organism because it carries your genes. But we are special, and as Salin said, we have this capacity for intersubjectivity. What if we can recognize the kin altruism that motivates another person towards us? It's not only that, well, you are my nephew, so automatically I will help you, right? Because you have 25% of my genes. But what if you're my cousin, I'm gonna help you. Of course, not like this, 25% of your genes, but I'm also your cousin, so you, I expect you to help me. Again, to the genealogical distance between us. And this is something that animals cannot do. They cannot represent minds, they cannot represent this kind of view from nowhere where you see, and not only that, but then adding uh, this intersubjective perspective to other people's relationships, realizing that they also think of one each other as relatives in various ways. So thank you very much, and look forward to your comments and criticism. I think that uh, loyalty, I think we can, um, uh, we can reduce it to fairness. Loyalty is a kind of promise that we make uh, to another, which is um, reciprocal in the sense that I would be loyal to you because you're loyal to me. But again, even loyalty is uh, never total. Right? So um, I'll be loyal to you uh, in any case, but if you're going to, for example, I don't kill my child, I don't think our commitment to loyalty extends to even such, uh, such things. I think it's frustrating that there are so many similarities while we always sort of try to emphasize the differences since a lot of times when I'm reading Salins and each time when he's negating a biological mechanism he's mentioning something which resonates so much with many of the things that we find in uh, psychology. I think it's just that because he was so much focused on kin selection only and because honestly, because he associated with a certain uh, bourgeois ideology of the bounded and self-regarding bourgeois individual. And it's not individual. In biology, the organism is a gene's way of making other genes. Uh, I think Stalin's had a beef with capitalism, not with biology.
And I think that if you'd have looked more into biology without those ideological lenses, I think he would have found a lot of, of uh, commonalities. Because the success of our species is not that we are this bonded, self-regarding individuals, but because we are the most cooperative species out there. I mean, the kind of mutualism that we have, this kind of no other animal is capable of having this large group cooperation, this kind of tolerance for uh, in uh, reciprocity, this kind of mental accounts uh, of who cooperated with whom, these reputation systems. We are so incredible because we cooperate so much, not because we are this uh, individual, uh, I don't know, stockbrokers or, uh, or whatever. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of commonalities and, um, and it's true that there's been a lot of developments in biology and evolutionary psychology since the 1970s. To be honest, yeah, there are, plainly speaking, there are a lot of Nazis back there. Uh, but now there are a lot of really good theories and cooperation is, and this is just one approach to cooperation. There are others as well. There are uh, things that look towards group selection. And it's fascinating, in uh, cultural evolution, we have uh, cultural group selection which is uh, Durkheim reloaded in a certain way. And I'm against it. I don't think on theoretical and empirical grounds, I don't believe in it. But the kind of discussions that existed in anthropology for a long time are being now taken over in, uh, in those fields. So this was one point. Uh, so no, uh, I think the gap is artificial. We can bridge it, I'm sure we will do it. Partner choice, of course, starts from the assumption that you have honorary partners. But sometimes you only have one, so what you can do then is just partner control. Which is, well, collaborate with me, otherwise I will sanction you. I think there are very, very rare cases in which you only end up with one possible cooperator. Indeed, in the sphere of kinship, genealogy might only give you one brother or one cousin. But that's one part, and then you have other possible cooperative partners that you can make kin. So you have one brother, you don't get along uh, with them, but you may get a ritual brother, which is going to be, and as people say, a better brother than your actual brother. Choice doesn't mean utter freedom. Choice means that people can creatively manipulate any kind of identities, including kinship, but again, again ethnicity and uh, religion and so on, in order to establish cooperative relationships or to destroy them. I didn't talk too much about the family since the family, in theory, is exactly that place of generalized reciprocity, sharing without uh, keeping accounts. And this is indeed what people say and how people behave until they stop behaving like that. Because at a certain point, there are structural tensions in a family, and one which is classical is that at some point, children are going to leave the paternal family. Well, it was generalized reciprocity before, when they go and establish their own households, then the problem is, okay, what is the fair share that I'm going to take from this uh, common pool that we all had? And indeed, people don't think so much in terms of individual property. I mean, you have the domestic unit, which is quite important, the side of production, consumption, and so on. And don't think, oh, this sheep belong to the man and uh, that house the woman, even though they are symbolically associated. No, it's their sheep and their house and so on. But at some point, somebody's going to leave and they have to take some sheep. How many of them? And this starts to be thinking in terms of, uh, of fairness. And when people complain about their relatives, it's this feeling that they had that it was not just, that uh, there was a, a certain justice that they saw in the division of how much they worked for their families, how well they treated their parents, and that they were mistreated, that they should have gotten more. And then when you see successful relations between them, it's because they continue to collaborate and they think of each other as being uh, fair and reasonable and trustworthy. Now, one important thing is, with this ethic of uh, mistrust, all this fear of relatives, because there is fear of strangers in general, it's reasonable to be afraid of relatives because relatives are those people towards whom you're less guarded. You let your guard down. Who is going to cheat on you? Who is going to uh, betray you? Who can attack you? It's exactly those people that you welcome in your house, that you start uh, doing any kind of uh, business with. Uh, towards strangers, because you're afraid of them, they have less chances of backstabbing you. And that's something that people, so many times they say, that he's been in my house, or she's been in my house. So the fact that they were somewhere in that intimate area, and it's from the within that they become uh, treacherous.
That's why this, this fear of relatives is, is, uh, is worse. And, in, and of course, comparing it with the expectation that it's relatives that should be moral, you open up towards them because they're moral, and they uh, attack you. If I wanted to do politics, I would have been now in a party and making much more money. Yeah. Than, uh, I became an anthropologist because I want to understand the world. And there is absolutely no reason why a cognitive, naturalist, evolutionary approach ignores or uh, is better than a political economy and many other approaches. They're complementary. And why is the political not natural? We have hierarchies in nature. We have cooperation, we have uh, cliques. Uh, I mean, look at uh, chimpanzee or baboon politics. They're sometimes even more fascinating and sometimes cleaner than human politics. When you said that, uh, whether it is dangerous, no, I think it's exciting. Aren't you bored with people uh, with, uh, that come up with political economy? With, have you, aren't you bored with neoliberalism? Aren't you bored with capitalism? Aren't you bored with uh, really bad readings of Marx? Aren't you? Well, I am. I was. And, and, discussing about these differences, there's always in the background these large forces. And uh, beyond politics, ecology, so, I mean, the climate uh, of this area, the quality of land is very important, the history. Of course, all these institutions, the long history, and I'm not talking about communism. I mean, there is a study which shows that in a, uh, two villages area, and it's done by economists, when you play economic games with them, these two villages are like five kilometers apart. One of them was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The other one was part of a region which was alternatively dominated by uh, Tsarist Russia or the Ottoman Empire. Guess in which village uh, people cooperate more. Fascinating. That's a long-term history. That's political economy. How did it uh, translate into this kind of norms of cooperation, into trusting other people? I'm really open, and I really understand so much about Of course, not everybody can do everything. But then again, as in, uh, and as in a market of cooperation, how many people have, in this seminar, presented evolutionary, cognitive, naturalistic approaches? Quite a lot. That's fancy. <laughs> oh, because I'm in my right place. <laughs> well, that's the LSE. It's very true. However, if you get to read my book, you'll see that actually it's women who are the main actors of kinship. Because as in many societies, it's women. This pattern of holding on to kin, it's especially women that do it. All these visits, all these rituals, uh, funerals, women are the key players there. And of course, the locus of uh, making and holding on to kin is the home. I mean, it's a classical distinction. The tavern is for men, what the home is for women. So it's their site of power and drawing their attention. Indeed, the kind of conflicts that I'm describing are mostly associated with men because the type of cooperation that divides people, such as you know, like politics and uh, kind of economic sheep uh, breeding and so on, is mostly a man, uh, man part. But of course. Women as well getting in, into conflicts. I mentioned that it was a woman who wanted to drown her two young siblings because they were um, eating out her uh, inheritance. And actually, it's true that perhaps in this presentation, men received too much attention. That's a very interesting question because they think a lot about animals, especially sheep and cows and, and dogs. And you can see that there is not only an anthropomorphization of intentions, characters, so describing, for example, dogs with human-like traits and so on, but also thinking about these kind of kinship structures, which is especially important for sheep. For uh, The tint of their wool is quite important, so they trace these kind of genealogical links. They know which ram belongs to that shepherd, and he's like the grandfather of this one. So they really think about the kinship of the animals, but it's, uh, it's a parallel system. There is no, uh, there is no way in which uh, animals and humans are engaged in the same... Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, they really see animals as being subservient. And of course, uh, humans have been kind of paternalistic protectors, uh, but still masters of the animal world. Yeah, and it's something I'm uh, trying to, uh, to think whether these intuitions about uh, kinship offer coordination 
point for um, actions for behaviors which which are detached then from uh, let's say biological kinship. <laughs> Consanguine kinship is a blueprint for affinal and fictive ritual relatedness. I think it's a cross-cultural universal. When we have uh, fictive or ritual kin, does it borrow from cognatic or from affinal kin? Well, it terms, norms, and so on. It's really cognatic. So you don't really have a ritual brother-in-law, you have a ritual brother. And also, affinal relationships, at least in certain, the brother-in-law is like a brother. The relationship between uh, the father-in-law of, of the spouses is like between uh, brothers. The relationship with a mother-in-law is like the relationship with a mother. And sometimes she's being called like little mother, in a certain way. So it's always consanguine kinship that is the blueprint. If you think about the, the uncle-nephew relationship, intuitively. It will give you a sense of uh, okay, where will the, um, uh, the um, most transfers, will they go from nephew to uncle or from uncle to nephew. When you have this as an intuitive uh, blueprint, then you can apply it to other kinds of relationships uh, and we, people can coordinate upon it. What it means for a partner choice is that if I evaluate the behavior of someone, how did this person behave towards his uh, ritual brother? Right. And then I can uh, observe actual behavior with a kind of ideal rules, and then I can evaluate how that person behaved with his uh, ritual brother and see whether he's a good or she's, she's well, let's see, potentially, if she's a good cooperator or not. I totally agree with science that kinship is about mutuality of being. What I don't agree is the fact that he says it has no relationship with biology. Look at this table. How do you carve at the joints of kinship here? So biological kinship is this. But what we live is this. That's the problem when you're having like two factors in the same time. And one of them can be present, the other one can be absent, the other way around, both absent, both present. We always try to look for this kind of like magic bullet, one single explanation. When you have like two factors, already things get in this kind of fuzzy identities when, yeah, there is no genetic kin blood, but we're sharing substances. As you said, yeah, we're living together, we're drinking, we're eating from the, from the same thing. Or the other way around, we are brothers, however, I hate your guts and I want to see you <coughs> die. But why? Because we share genes? No, but because there is another factor, which is conflict. Absence of cooperation and, in fact, the other way around, conflict. So I totally agree with Salins that mutuality of being is, in a way, at the core of kinship, but there is still a biological mechanism of mutualistic cooperation which has purchasing power for, to explain a lot of things about kinship. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's quite powerful. There was a land reform after the First World War when uh, peasants received land from three to five hectares per veteran. This was a great boon for them, but this only lasted for 30, 30 something years. And even though they received land, uh, this was overlapping with uh, the demographic explosion. So uh, due to increased uh, health and so on, people started having more and more children. I mean, they had a lot of children before, but they were dying. Now they started dying less and less and with better food. So what you have is exactly division and fragmentation of uh, land. Nowadays, a family might have four hectares in five different places of the village due to this kind of... They, uh, sometimes when they married in another village, they try to find another couple who was doing the uh, reverse marriage so they could exchange land. But it's so different, and uh, because land is of heterogeneous quality, they talk a lot about, oh, this land is... Uh, this. I mean, I couldn't see why one land was better than the other one, but that is really, well, stubborn ideas, as you said. Of course, no, they're not as stubborn, and you can see these skin relationships fluctuate quite a lot across time. Uh, but let me tell you something, and let me bring up a woman here, uh, one of my best informants. Not only that, they're, they're, they're very cunning, and, and I, I really, I was amazed by how, how smart they were in negotiating Kishim. When that woman knew that she was going to marry a daughter, a few years in advance, she was holding on to kin, paying this kind of uh, visits having a coffee, going to their rituals. And slowly, slowly she was preparing her universe of kinship, right? P 
the people that she was about to call for the wedding, to bring gifts and uh, so on. So at a certain point, she started remembering, okay, who are my relatives? And let's start, but this was an, an incredible woman. She was, so, she was so powerful and so, so hardworking. And of course, sometimes maybe uh, there was a relative that uh, they were not on good terms, but you know what? Yeah, maybe we've forgotten about that. It's a good time to become friends again. So yeah, of course, people do. Fight. But what I'm interested in is, uh, I mean, these idiosyncratic patterns are, it's a lot of them. But in this presentation, I paid more attention, let's say, like structural recurring patterns. Oh, yeah. oh, but in Sadede, it produces a lot. So again, women, one of the stories in the book is a sister of a, a man who had just died and she observed that his wife was not mourning uh, or not enough. And uh, she told him, why are you not sad? I mean, your man has died, my brother. And the woman retorted, tell me the words to mourn him and I will. Because she had a really difficult life with him and she did not want to signal to the village that she actually cared for him. So that was a very strong signifier to the entire village that yes, she is a proper woman, she's going to bury her husband, but she's not going to mourn him because mourning would have said that she really cared for, for his loss and she didn't. And everybody noticed that and mourning is a very powerful signal because you mourn publicly, you mourn so that everybody sees it and people pay very much attention to how much people like genuinely care for uh, someone they can detect if you're uh, feigning, uh, feigning these kind of signals so yeah it's, it's very productive I was fascinated with funerals everything during a funeral has a very powerful significance actually they say that uh, you can see a life's, uh, the life of a person at their funeral uh, and at funeral you see the actual universe of kinship exactly when that person died. Who is there is a relative, who is not there is not a relative, and that gets inscribed into transcendence. So if you were not there when a person had died for the wake, for the funeral, it's as if you were not a relative. And then those concentric circles of cooperation are being expressed in everything, in, in uh, how much uh, you're mourning, how long you're going to uh, spend there, uh, where you'll be positioned during a ritual when everybody holds, puts a hand over the other one. I, I think people speak uh, and read kinship uh, better than any other l symbolic language in that society. The simplest answer is um, comparability. Ethnographic material, the way I'm presenting it, the kind of concepts and the mechanisms that I use to interpret my ethnographic material allows for other people to compare their own ethnography with this one and between themselves. Now there used to be this uh, Manchester debate whether uh, anthropology is a comparative science or not. I'm not sure who won, but I think that if Anthropology is not a comparative science or discipline, then it's nothing. Uh, so I think that the universal uh, mechanisms I'm discussing about give us uh, a language to discuss, uh, to, for me to understand your material uh, and mine. But of course, then the particulars of each case is what makes anthropology fascinating, is that based on the, even a small set of universal mechanisms, and probably there are thousands of them, you, we can have an infinite uh, combinations that create human reality. So this is why uh, I, I try to offer this, both of these two parts. The universalist part is like the socket which allows us to communicate. Right? Uh, but what exactly is connected might be very different. And to be honest, I found uh, this perspective allowed me to link my ethnography with places like Madagascar, China, Africa, and in other places. Um, otherwise, what, what exactly would have been the comparative mechanisms comparing what with what? And of course, some people are not into comparison. Short answer to this one, no. It's about a lot of other things. It's about effect, it's about contingency, it's about accident, tragedy. If you read the book, you'll see that it's of uh, many, many things. However, yes, it's also about this kind of calculation, about uh, tactics. It's about a meaningful categorization of people, about creating 
classes, about uh, thinking in terms of certain relationships, about establishing a reputation, about reading the reputation of others, about uh, thinking uh, about the history of cooperation between people. So it's about a lot of things, as everything in life, I guess. So, and about the village, that's a very good question. Um, the identity that people have, it's definitely not a community, and I never really got to understand what exactly kept those people together, except uh, geographical proximity. Since, uh, well, people can change from one village to another one, there is nothing which makes them Satani as opposed to the other village. Okay, maybe they have uh, better land, uh, property, and so on. Let me give you why it's not a community. What is the worst thing in life for a Satani? Dying alone and being buried by the village. If you're buried by the village, you're buried by no one. It means that you are at the mercy of strangers. It means you have left behind you no meaningful relationship with someone who's going to be there when you die and is going to take care of you in this kind of mutualistic relationship as people take care of each other while they're alive. And indeed, I've seen people who are buried by the village. It's a really sad thing because, well, frankly speaking, they don't really, uh, I, I mean, they mean they care, but it's such a really basic level uh, of care that you can understand why the idea that you die alone, it means that there is no transcendent uh, future. You'll be in a grave, but no one will tend to it. Even in material terms, in the memory of other people, you will be gone. So you'll be socially, transcendentally dead, just as you, as you are biologically dead. And that, for most people, is the worst fear that they have. And that's why people who have this kind of problem, they will adopt uh, unrelated people and create this kind of fictive children who sometimes are even better than uh, real children. And, and people do say that. I know a case of, of a guy who was adopted like this. He was poor but uh, hardworking. An old uh, woman took him in and his wife. And uh, so they lived together. He took care of the old woman and she died. But when she died, some distant relatives came and they contested the inheritance and they took everything. However, he said, okay, I don't need your land, your money or anything. But he buried her and he kept on doing all the rituals, all the commemorations, which can be quite expensive over years and years. And there's a question, why did he do it? He was truly a guy with really strong moral character, true to his words. But at the same time, you can see that people looked at that and said, what a great man. He didn't get anything, but look at him, how he kept on his promise that old woman and performed all the rituals. And this is the kind of person you want to cooperate with. You, uh, you call him for jobs. You want to be next to him. You don't, uh, it sends a signal that he is honest and he is reliable, and that's the kind of person you want to cooperate with. Unlike other children who inherit a lot, and then they forget their dead parents. Uh, because the way you treat your relatives tells something about your moral character. I'm not even sure where theories are placed right now. Actually, I'm truly an opportunistic uh, consumer of theories. Whatever fits the data, I'm going to use. So, no, uh, no Friday seminar next week because of the strike, but we've got a very own Agat the week after, so looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah, please join me in thanking Radu for a really interesting... Thank you. Nu vă supărați pe mine. Eu am strâns Colorado ăsta, o plecare în vieță, voi imediat. Și dacă nu crăp eu sau nu mor eu, fac și asta tot în ricator. Și pentru toți copiii mei va mânca cartofi de aici și toți prietenii mei vor mânca cartofi de aici. Ăștia sunt ai mei, al fișorul meu dincolo și al fiica mea. Dar o să mâncăm tot grămadă. Acest alcâm... Uh... Este când am avut un nou an, a ieșit instantaneu. L-am îngrijit, l-am uh, săpat în jurul lui, am turnat apă să crească, după cum vedeți. 
ne folosind că de, de, am dat de, pentru el ca umbră. Umbra este pentru casă, unde stăm la masă, în fine. Acum am sfătuit cu nevastă mea să ne pregătim, să lăsăm pentru moarte. Zis să facem un, o, o cruci, două, cât să ne ajungă pentru noi. Deocamdată nu știu, ea spune că ajunge, eu spun că nu e ajunge, eu știu. Zi mă, ți ajunge? Da, eu sunt sătură, mă dorm mai așa de la sat. Noi lasă lasă sapa, dar asta e pentru tine. moarte, mă, pentru... Vrei tai eu de jos și de sus și îți faci În fine, asta e situația, o să vedem că noi o să mai o să tai copiii noștri. Da, să tai. Bine că are cine, dacă nu avea cine, nu tai eu.